Welcome everybody. I'm Irene Pasternak, teaching Feldenkrais with the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation. And today I have a really fun class lined up for us. And it's a class all about our butts. We're going to be learning how to use our bottom better for walking, sitting, and um, we've played with some of the things about our bottoms before, but today you're going to learn things you never knew about your, your bottom. So I'm going to share my screen for a moment and put a picture of the main gluteus muscle, the gluteus maximus, on the screen. Oops, there we go. All right, so do you see a picture of the back of somebody? Yeah, okay. So you see those two big muscles on the back of you. I want you to use your hands and find them. So they start, there's a triangular bone that your, your sacrum here, and then your tailbone goes down. And the muscles, there's the bone at the top of your hip that you can put your hands around. You can feel that bone and the, the gluteus maximus attaches right on the back of that bone along the edge of the sacrum and tailbone and then it comes down and it attaches on your uh, the greater trochanter of your femur so if you find the spot on the side of your hip right here where your thigh bone comes close to the skin that's where the bulk of the muscle attaches, and then there's a little bit of it that goes all the way down your thigh bone. So it's the biggest muscle that connects your legs to your upper body in, in there. All right, go ahead and, and sit down if you're standing and Come and sit in the way we, we sit for these lessons toward the front of your chair with air behind your, underneath your thighs, your feet flat on the ground. And let's do a, a scan so that you can feel the changes at the end. Um, notice how your bottom is resting on the chair. Do you have more weight on one side than the other? Wake up your sit bones by wiggling a little bit and feeling those bones. And see, when you start wiggling back and forth, do you wiggle more around the left one or the right one? And when you stop moving, is your weight a little bit more on the left side or the right side? get a sense of how tall you feel today. So if you had a measuring stick, you could imagine a, a yardstick behind you that's, that's going from the chair up to the top of your head, or some of you are taller, you might need a little longer than a yardstick. Um, and just, just get a sense of how long the back of your neck feels. And then come on up and stand up. And get a sense of your height in standing, how tall you feel today. And then begin to walk and notice what propels you forward. So where is the, the source of the power that makes you go forward? As always in the beginning of the lesson, sometimes I'll ask questions and it won't be so clear what the answer is. But somewhere, somehow you go walk. And if you wanted to walk faster, what do you change about how you walk to walk a little faster? And notice as you're walking, what movements are there in your pelvis? You could rest your hands on your hips as you walk and see, does your pelvis move at all as you're, as you're walking?
and then come back and sit down. And notice how you chose to sit down. Did you sit down at the front of the chair again with your feet under you? Or did you cross your legs or put your feet together? Are you leaning back? Just notice what your habit is and then come to the front of the chair again with your feet wide. And notice as you're sitting there with your left foot, is there more weight under the inside of the ball of your foot or the outside of the ball of your foot? You could roll that left foot a little bit in and out so that you press harder on the big toe side or you press harder underneath the base of the fourth toe. Feel how your knee responds to that. Okay. And then with your right foot, where's the weight? Is it more toward the inside of the ball of the foot or the outside? and explore with the right foot a little bit, going in, pushing under the big toe, pushing under the fourth toe. Last week we played with a roller under the foot. So you could imagine there was a roller under your foot and you're rolling, rolling it around a little bit. Okay. So now we're gonna start playing with the gluteus medius, the big muscle in, in, in the buttocks, the one that gives us that nice round tush shape, part of the back of us. And squeeze both buttocks and see what happens. Do you get taller? It's fun looking at everybody's heads in gallery view and zoom. I can see everybody just kind of goes blank, you know, up a little bit higher. And does one buttock engage before the other? Does one feel like it's smarter than the other? Like it, it, it knows it's easier to talk to, to say, hey, you engage. For most people, there's a little difference and usually one will go just a split second before the other. So I want you to pick the one that feels stronger or that goes first that, that and we're just gonna play on that side. So squeeze just that one buttock and see what happens. So there's a way that it, it might have a sensation that it makes you taller just on one side of you, which might move your shoulders over to the side a little bit. Does it transfer your weight when you squeeze that one buttock? Does it shift your weight a little onto the other one? And the, the, the gluteus maximus is, is this big muscle that we were just looking at. Where in the gluteus maximus do you feel it squeezing? You could put your hand back on that buttock and see if you can sense, do you feel it more near where it attaches to your thigh? Kind of right under in the, in the back, there's a little um, oh kind of gap between the muscles where you can feel it. Or do you feel it more up towards your sacrum and your tailbone? It's actually a fairly big and complicated muscle. And so it has some fibers going one way and some fibers going a little different way. And how we each choose to contract our own gluteus maximus is different than how other people might do it. And so just feeling what your pattern of doing that is. Okay, now begin paying attention to your knee on that side. So when you squeeze that one buttock, does your knee roll out a little? So your weight goes out more toward your fourth, the base of your fourth toe, or does your knee roll in a little? And do you contract anything else when you contract that buttock muscle? Do your hamstrings, the muscles behind your legs contract, or your belly? or your front of your thigh, your quadriceps. And see if you can let all those muscles relax and just contract the buttock. All right, rest for a moment. 
and close your eyes and sense if you feel different left and right. If one side of your face and your neck and your shoulder are a little more relaxed than the other, perhaps um, one sit bone, one side of your chair feels softer than the other. Then go back with that same foot and the same sit bone, sorry, the same gluteus, the same buttock, and contract it. And this time, at the same time, try and build the arch in your foot, in the same foot, where you slide your, your toes almost come back into you so that the middle of the foot lifts. And there, there might be a sensation if you think of the bones on the top of the foot that make the top of the arch, that they roll to the outside a little bit and then go behind your ankle on the outside. That there's a, if, if, you, if you put your own hand on your foot, you'd be sliding around that way to guide it. Okay. Let's play with the other side a little bit. So squeeze the other side. And when you squeeze this side, is it one smooth movement or is even when it's just this one muscle, does it feel like one piece of it engages and then another piece engages? Like perhaps the lower part of it engages and then the upper or the upper engages and then the lower. See if you can actually find two places in the muscle to engage so that you can make it a two-step process. And then begin to pay attention to how it makes you taller and how it shifts your weight. When you lift this side up, it shifts your weight a little. And let it shift your weight over to the other side. So the buttock squeezes and then it lifts you. And pay attention to your foot on this side, trying to keep your foot under the fourth so there's a way that your leg stays where it is and your torso moves up and a little over to the other side. And you might find your belly even rotates a little bit as you do it, as you're shifting the weight. And on this side, are you engaging anything else? Are you engaging your quadriceps, the muscles on the front of the thigh, the hamstrings in the back or the belly muscles. See if you can isolate it to just the buttock muscle. Okay, rest for a moment. And check out how you're sitting on the chair. And close your eyes to intensify the sensation to notice, ah, is it flatter, broader? So the chair changes its texture. How upright are you feeling? For those of you who are working on posture and concerned about posture, notice your sense of uprightness. And then squeeze both sides and see if it's a little different than it was before, if, if things have evened out a little bit. And Let's alternate a few times. Squeeze one side and then the other. And see what it does to your head. Now when you squeeze one side, close your eyes because this will help your sensation. There's an up force. How does that up force go through your body? If you had to like take a, a yardstick and and show me the line that that force goes from your buttock contracting up through your spine. Somehow it's making you a little taller. Where does the force come into your spine when you, when you squeeze it? And it can be quite different depending on how our bodies are organized. Some people it will intersect with their lumbar spine, with their low back. Some people it will intersect in the middle of the spine or the top. 
or some it just kind of can it can feel like it goes up to your head or up to your shoulder and experiment so if you had a yardstick and it, it was being lifted up by this butt contracting make it come up through your body in different ways see if you can aim it in different places One of the things that often happens to us as we age and with Parkinson's is um, uh, scoliosis develops where the back adds a little extra um, curve to it. And that's because the forces coming up from your legs and the bottom are hitting at different places. So if, let me grab my cake spine. If when one buttock comes up, the force goes down here and the other buttock, the force comes up there, it's gonna curve your back. So in an ideal world, the force coming up through us would come up to the same place and just lift the spine rather than push it in some uneven curve. So try on your other side now, squeezing the other buttock and visualizing that line of force coming up through you and send it to different places. Give your brain some options. And this is where I'm very glad I'm a human being, not a programmer programming a robot. Because as a human being, all I have to do is think, oh, I want the force to come up to my shoulder and I can aim it there. That we don't have to consciously do that. But the more we play with that, then you can play with both of them, squeezing both and try and squeeze them both so they hit your spine in the same place. And then pick a different part of your spine and squeeze your buttocks so that they come to that spot and a different spot, trying to make them engage right at the same moment and go straight up your body. You can imagine that they can, the two lines converged even in a spot above your head. So it's like this sky hook is connected to, to those squeezes. Okay, rest for a moment. A question. Yeah. So I haven't been able to walk for much of the last year, so I don't have much of the weight. My glutes are pretty gone, but I'm walking now. Um, but I can engage them on the laying on the floor, standing up, or I, I can't engage them when I'm sitting on them. I'm sitting there trying to sit to engage, make them engage the whole it, time. It, it, it's just being real hard to talk to them. Yeah, I'm just sitting on the bone. They're all I'm sitting on. So hard um, not very much. So let's play um, in a different position and then we'll come back to sitting and see if it gets easier at that point. So okay. every, yeah, everybody stand up for a moment. Oh, actually I want, I want to do one more thing in sitting, sorry. And then we'll, that we'll stand up. Okay, thanks. For those, for those who, um, and, and Bill, could you um, mute yourself again for, um, thank you. Um, try squeezing them quick and fast. So, so it's, it's kind of like you're, you're, you're going bouncy, bouncy, bouncy um, with your, and so when you do it quick and fast, it's not as big a contraction, but just trying to talk to it to, to, to wake it up there. Okay. So now stand up. And in standing, squeeze your buttocks. So here, different parts of us are fixed to the ground. So it's gonna be a very different motion because all of the muscles in our body work differently when we're in one position and another position. So in this position, when you squeeze your buttocks together, what happens? What happens to your feet? Do your feet roll a little more toward the outside or to the inside? Does your pelvis shift a little forward in space when you squeeze your buttocks together or backwards in space. And does it tip your pelvis at all? So does your pelvis tip a little forward, backward? And in standing, does one feel like it engages before the other? 
standing's a little easier to put your hands behind and feel, feel this muscle engaging. And if you feel a little one faster than the other, or if you don't, whichever one feels stronger or faster to engage, play with that one a few times and see in standing what happens when you squeeze this buttock. How does it transfer your weight a little bit? Does it make your belly turn a little bit? Does your belly turn toward the buttock you're squeezing or away from it? Does it make your head turn a little bit? And then play with the other one of squeezing it. So I have a friend who's a PT and what um, we were we were talking about muscles and she she said that this is the most common one that people forget they have. This this big muscle in in the in the gluteus maximus that so getting it back online is is an important thing. Now so playing with the second one see what happens see what your foot does on that side see how your weight transfers a little what your belly does and let's do a little experiment turn your toes pointing inward a little bit and put the weight on the big toes and try and squeeze your buttocks like that And then turn your feet so they're pointing out a little bit and put the weight down under the pad of the fourth and squeeze your buttocks. And see which gets a more powerful contraction in the buttocks. And then sit down for a moment. And glue your feet together and your knees together. And push your big toes toward each other. And like that, try to squeeze your buttock muscles and see what it feels like. And then take your knees wide, roll your feet out a little bit, point them out a little bit, and squeeze the buttock muscles and see what it feels like. So our habits of sitting can be what turn off the, the buttock muscles. Now, another way people like to sit is, uh, especially we short people, is we um, lean forward and tuck our feet under the chair so that our feet are up on their toes underneath. Try, try that for a minute and see what it's like to engage the buttock muscle. It engages quite differently there. You could cross your legs. That's another way people like to sit. And see what it's like. Can you do them both at the same time or is there one that's really primary when your legs are crossed? And then come on back up to standing. And Go and find either a small stool or a couple of books that you can pile up that you'd be willing to put your foot on. Now, Cindy, Cindy has the best device I've ever seen for doing for doing this. I don't know, Cindy, could you could you hold that up and put it near the computer for a sec just so people can see it? It's a thing called a bed stand or a bed lifter. It's like a stool, but it has a handle on it. Really handy for stepping up onto to get into bed or for doing these kinds of exercises. For those of you who don't have one of those, which is I think everybody else, um, use the back of your chair like Cindy has the handle on her bedstand 
so that you can hold on to your chair while you put one foot up on your stool or your pile of books. So this position is kind of the position that you're in when you're walking and you're taking a step where your back leg is trying to push you onto the front leg. So try squeezing the back leg buttock, the, the gluteus maximus on the back side, and feel how it begins the process of lifting you as if you were gonna step up onto the book or the, the stool. And how it can allow your belly to turn a little bit toward your front leg. And your standing leg the arch gets lifted a little bit. And then try it on the other side, switch legs. So you squeeze the standing leg buttock and feel how it begins to shift you a little bit forward and turn you a little bit toward the leg on the stool. Okay. And now go for a walk and um, sense how you are propelled forward. Is there a way that you use your buttocks to push you from your back foot to your forward foot? And then come and have a seat again. So Bill, was it easier to find in standing? Okay. So for everybody, try it again in sitting and see if it's getting clearer and easier to fire them both at once and have the force come up your body. Okay. Now, back a long time ago, toward the beginning of the series, we did a lesson where you were, I, I call it the half ass lesson, where you're sitting on a book. So we're going to play with that for a few minutes in the context of the, of the glutes today. So, you know, come up with a book. It doesn't have to be a big book. Just a paperback is fine. Or and put it under half your bottom, left, right, half, so it's lined up with the crack in your bottom. The book is on one side of that. So one sit bone's on the book, one's on the chair. Sorry about that, it will stop in a minute. And the, the buttock that's on the chair, contract that buttock, which lifts you up a little bit, and then contract the buttock on the book to pull you onto it. So it's like one buttock contracts and lifts you a little, and then the other side contracts and scoops you over your sit bone. See if you can find the sequence of one goes and then the other goes. It's really this lovely cascade of muscles that allows us to do anything, and that there's a one and then the other. so that you really get all the way up on that sit bone. And when we did this before, we played there are other ways to get up on the sit bone. You could push down with the lower leg. So you push into the floor and that lifts you. You could raise your arm that's above the book as if you wanted to reach up for something. And that kind of pulls your ribs by pulling your ribs, it pulls you up and over. And you can see that the arm motion doesn't really use the, 
the glutes muscles very much. And the pushing down with your foot doesn't use the glute muscle very much. But that there's another way to do it, which is the glute squeeze and then the other glute squeeze. Okay, take your book out, rest for a moment. Notice any differences in sensation under your bottom. And then let's try the book on the other side. So find the sequence again of first the one on the chair that lifts you up and helps you turn a little bit toward the book leg. And then the book leg glute can engage and pop you up. So it's kind of cool in the way one glute gets you part way there and then the other glute takes you the other, the other way. And a few times try that raising your hand, the book hand, if you look at it, you imagine there's a sky hook and you're like throwing a rope up there. We had a tree guy cutting down some branches and he just would throw this rope and hook it over the, the upper branch. You could imagine doing that, throwing the rope up. And feel how your glute doesn't really have to work then. Or you could push with your other foot and it pushes you up and over. Or go back to the two glute way. The low glute fires to lift you and then the other glute fires, but at a little angle, so it kind of scoops you up onto it. Every step we take in walking, we have to be able to get all the way over one leg in order to have the other one free to move. So this ability to take our torso and go up and over is fundamental. Okay. Take the book out, rest for a moment. I want to talk for a moment about a different muscle. And let me share my screen again. So this muscle in the, this is looking at the front of you, is your iliopsoas muscle. And, oops, got to make it long, longer. It attaches to all the vertebrae in your lumbar spine. It attaches to your bottom floating rib. This part of it attaches to the inside of the crest of your hip, your iliac crest. And then both of them come together at this bump on the inside of your thigh called your lesser trochanter. And here is the sit bone and you'll see that bump on your lower thigh is above your sit bone. It's way deep inside. And then here's the right angle of your hip. That's your, your femurs coming up. And then it, you can just see the little bit of the ball of the hip joint underneath there. So this is the main muscle that connects us on our front side between our upper body and our lower body. And it's the muscle that's used when you lift a leg. So go ahead and lift one leg a little bit. And if you take your hand and wrap it, you can put your thumb behind the iliac crest and your fingers just hanging out, kind of reaching in there. When you lift your leg, you'll feel this muscle contracting. You have to go a little deeper to find this one. It's a little harder to find in this position that we're in. So when you lift your leg, this big muscle is shortening. So there's a force on your spine that makes your lower back arch a little bit. So a few times as you lift your leg, arch your lower back, and that's this muscle getting to its, its shortest in the front. And when it's at its shortest, 
the glute is, is pulled longer in the back. Okay. So lift your other leg a few times, thinking about that leg in the front, you're shortening the distance between your lower spine and your upper thigh. So now um, curve your bottom under, like tuck your tail as you're sitting. And with your tail tucked, lift your leg a few times. And then arch your back and lift your leg. And then leave the leg and a few times, just tuck your tail and untuck it. Thinking about that psoas muscle attached to all the vertebrae in your spine, that when you tuck your tail, you're taking your spine and your leg away from each other. And when you arch, you reach your tail back to wag your tail, you're taking that muscle shorter. and then stand up and walk a little bit. Let's see if you feel anything different left and right. And then come and sit down. And we'll play a little bit with the other side. So lift your other knee a few times. And then once when you lift it, arch your back. And once when you lift it, round your back. And feel how it uses really different muscles when you're arching your back or when you're rounding your back. And then leave your leg down, tuck your tail, untuck your tail, wag it. Feel how that's moving the top of the gluteal muscle a little bit. And now squeeze your both um, gluteus, both gluteus maximus, both buttocks, squeeze them together. And feel how that squeeze has a little bit of a tuck of the tail that, that happens when it squeezes. Like if you try to arch your back and, and wag your tail, and you try to squeeze your buttocks, you get a very different response in the muscles. It's way lower down in the muscle. Whereas if your tail is, if, if you let yourself tuck a little, you get an even stronger response. And just feel, does, do your buttocks feel like they've gotten stronger over the course of this lesson? Like there's just more, more meat there that, that, that's um, engaged in, in the squeeze. And walk around a little bit and feel this time, pay attention to what propels you. And is there a way that you can walk propelled by your, um, by your alternating buttock contractions? That somehow contracting on one side helps keep your foot out to the fourth and push you up and over onto your other side. And check in as you come back to your chair with your, your mood, your sense of, um, I don't know, potency in the world of 
you know, if you find your thoughts beginning to go, oh, when class is over, I really wanted to go do that or, um, because when when the when our buttocks are are part of our um, sense of ourself, there's usually a little more drive in 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 life. So anyhow, let's open it for some discussion. I'd love to hear questions, thoughts, things you noticed. I noticed that there was very very little difference between. Uh, very little motion when I squeeze my buttocks alternately or together. Together, I sort of raised up uh -huh. uh, side to side. There didn't seem to be much rocking. So do I have an extraordinarily weak gluteus maximum? Um, it sounds like your gluteus maximum has not found all of its potential. Yeah. So as you're, as you're sitting here now, try squeezing one side and deliberately shifting your weight to the other side. And see if that helps you find some more of the fibers and engage in the muscle. So sometimes we have to deliberately do the motion until we can find that pattern. Yeah, and then try the other side. It was harder than I thought it would be. Isolate those muscles. Uh-huh. Our habits are strong and you have habits for how you contract your glutes. And um, we're trying to invite some new possibilities in the habits because then you get a little bit more rotation as you walk and a little easier to keep your feet stable. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Sharon. Well, my um, massage therapist, told me to think about engaging my glute because she thinks I have it always engaged and she wants me to, th and I told her I couldn't find it. I found it. Yay. <laughs> Once you find it, then you can pay attention to it. But when you can't find it, it's a, uh, yeah. I noticed a number of things. Um, the first one is I had no idea that my glute wrapped round to the front. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a big thing to know. I thought it was always just in back. Um, and the other thing I noticed in, in everything I did when I would shift, when I'd um, squeeze my left glute, my left pelvis comes forward. <clears throat> uh -huh. I'm not, it's not even, it's, I, feel, I feel exactly where, where the rotation is. Um, so that was great. <laughs> so when you, when you squeeze your right glute, you might no, have I, to deliberately invite it to rotate forward because that coming forward when you squeeze it, that is a, as a, as a part of walking. It's part of the force we want in walking, but it's, well, it's getting the right one to do its job as well. So when I stand, put my left leg on that step and squeeze my left, my, my left pelvis comes forward to forward and to the right. With, so when your right foot's up on the step? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what you want to happen. Uh, then I have it reversed. Whatever we were supposed to do, it was going the opposite way. <laughs> the right side went the right way, and the other one went uh, not towards uh -huh. the middle. So something to, to experiment with and play and see if you can find the pattern to, to go the, so, that, so that, that squeeze puts you up towards your front foot. Yeah, it always goes the wrong way which makes sense to me. Uh, Ann Wood, you have to unmute yourself. I feel like I'm using my thigh muscles more to, to raise, to engage my glutes. So, so um, it's interesting because the thigh muscle, when it engages, it lifts your leg, which is the glute lengthening. So you have something going on where you're doing twice as much work as you need to. Because um, the thigh needs to be able to relax and lengthen in order for the glute to contract. So um, the thing to, to practice is, is to 
um, put your hands on your thigh so that you can talk to it and kind of stroke it the long way, like your hands going apart from each other on your thigh as you squeeze your glute. But it probably, it, it has to do with the position your pelvis is in. So you could experiment squeezing your glute with your tail tucked a little bit or with your tail arched a little bit. And you'll find one of those engages the thigh more than the other. And that might help you find some new possibilities in the rolling your pelvis. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, Jerry. It's interesting, as the classes develop, I'm learning more and more what muscles I have and how to use them. I have to admit, at 72 years old, I never thought about wagging my tail before. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to say thanks. You're welcome. It's, um, you know, we can get away with a lot when we're young. We don't have to learn how to use them because they just kind of function well enough for us to get by. But as, as we age and we have the accumulated years of patterns of injury and habits, um, then the, we develop these habits of moving and they can get in our way and we, we turn off muscles. You know, women who grew up wearing dresses and skirts, we, we put our legs together. And when your legs are together, the glutes don't function as well as when your legs are a little bit wider. Um, you have an, uh, an injury that makes you roll in or you develop a bunion. All, all those things contribute to the weird habits that happen. So you're in a great place for learning new habits, finding out you can wag your tail. Um, you know, get down on your hands and knees and look at a dog or a cat and try and mimic their movements. It's fun. Thinking uh, people, it's called twerking. Huh? Thinking younger people, it's called twerking. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. So I think what we're going to do on Thursday is more work on walking. Um, and more work helping to get the, the contralateral movements in walking going. But I'm looking for requests for things for next week's classes. If there's anything to straighten up our posture, uh, particularly I'm getting neck pains because I'm, my head's too far forward. So a lot of this, this glute stuff that we were playing with, and we'll, let me make a note just so, to continue doing more on posture. Um, it's how the force comes up from the bottom of you evenly that allows your neck to, to, to be here. The thing that gets neck pain the most is as we get worried about falling, everybody stand up for a moment and look down at the ground. And as you look down at the ground, you feel a shortening right um, right in the in the hip once that shortening happens your neck has to do really funny things to hold yourself up so a lot of posture comes from being able to open in the joint right between the pelvis and the leg so we'll work on that next time because then when that joint is open, the head comes. The other pattern that gets to all of us is too many years driving, cooking, on a computer, and having the shoulders roll so that the fabric here is tighter than the fabric here. And so we'll, we'll work on some of those things. But you feel how if you roll your feet out to the fourth, under the fourth, and squeeze your glutes together, how that brings your shoulders back and brings the back of your head a little taller. As opposed to rolling in on your feet, bending a little bit at the hip, how the arms and the shoulders just roll forward and the head and the neck, you can feel all the neck engage. But we'll, we'll continue playing with all those pieces. But really every class we're working on has something to do with posture because it's about getting the forces going up through our body so that there's a sense of lifting and coming up off the floor. Um, and um, 
and it's a it's an ongoing challenge because you're in this class two hours a week and how many hours a week are you on your computer are you sitting slouched watching whoops my head fell off um watching tv um uh all the positions where you bend at the hip and your arms are forward doing things. So um, those are some things to think about in how you allocate your hours in your life. Of um, It's pretty hard to counteract 22 hours of being in one position with, with two hours of experimenting with something else. Or So yeah, go ahead, Colleen. So I had a friend whose father was a, a long distance truck driver and he had to have shoulder surgery and because he always drove like this, you know, with his arm up and uh -huh. on the street. And the doctor told him if once an hour he had just moved and done the other arm, he would have been okay. And I thought, well, that's doable. Once an hour to just switch position instead of thinking you have to completely switch. Yes. And how many people when they sit do this with their hands? Is that... I don't know, I'm a fidgeter, and so I do this so I can play with my hands. Once an hour, look at which thumb is on top and switch it to the other thumb. Feels really weird, doesn't it? Totally weird. But doing that, this is directly connected. You'll find with your shoulders, when you're doing it your normal way, one shoulder wants to go lower. And if you try to take the other one down, it doesn't go down as easily. And if you switch to the other one, the other shoulder goes down. And just that helps get rid of some of the cattywampus things that we do in our torso. So trying, just notice whenever you choose one way, choose the other. I echo what Colleen said. I think especially with having to stay at home so much, um, I, I'm sitting a lot more. And I also am holding my phone a lot more, and I always hold it on one side, um, and it causes me to bend the other way. I think it's really helpful. Um, I know you've given me like little tips of something you can do for two minutes when you get up from sitting um, to kind of counteract a little bit the effects of, of sitting, because I'm definitely sitting, you know, not going on errands. There's a lot of places I'm not doing, you know, I'm sitting a lot more. I'll incorporate, I'll, I'll come up with something that's just like a quick short, you're, you're about to get up, you've been sitting a long time. And actually the thing we did today of tucking your tail and sticking your tail out, the pulling it under and going back, that, that little play, doing that a little bit before you stand up helps reset your psoas so that it can lengthen. Yeah, and you also gave me great tips on how to sit, like how your chair, where your hips should be and where your knees should be and what you're choosing, you know, what kind of chair works best for you. Flat chair, wide knees, feet flat on the ground. That does more for your posture if you can sit like that than, um, than anything else because you're not then having to fight the effects of being slumped in a chair and being behind your sit bones. And um, we'll keep playing with this stuff. It's a, it, it, it is a process, right? It's, it's, it's not like we're gonna get there in a day, and, um, but the, the little changes add up to more comfort. Alrighty, I'm gonna stop recording.